Hello everyone. Joining us today we have Martin Martin Hall. So Martin has worked in Hollywood production and post production for over 20 years and continues to evolve with storytelling technology. So Martin is a two time Emmy award winner for visual effects in Gritty John Adams for HBO and American Horror Story and Freak yes. Show for FX. So Martin's work has been exemplary each time. So most recently Martin Hall is slated to be the VFX supervisor for Netflix uh, next Bird Box feature that is Net, uh, Bird Box 2 and he was a supervisor on HBO's The United uh, Untitled Lakers Project and Perry Mason. So without any further delay let's listen to Martin speak about insights into making of all the old life. Yeah. All the old life. Yes. And others, yes. Hello everyone. Uh yeah, so thank you for having me. Um uh, yeah, so um I think I'll start off by just taking a look at one of the latest projects that just came out which was an Amazon project which was a sci-fi action movie called The Encounter and we'll just take a quick look at this and then I'll get into some more specific uh details about production, creativity, budgeting and and costs associated with that. Um but uh this project we'll take a look at here quickly is with the uh amazingly talented Riz Ahmed uh an actor um who's uh awesome in uh, the sound of metal this movie here is a uh, kind of a father son psychological drama with uh uh a father and his kids on a, it's more of a road picture family drama sci-fi it's a it's an interesting movie very character driven but there are some effects to tell the story so uh creature effects it's about sci-fi so there's trappings of you know extraterrestrial involvement uh parasitic invasion it's kind of body snatcher ish so uh it's of that ilk so the scope of the stuff you'll see here quickly in the trailer is simply uh a lot of cg bugs and animation um crickets uh cockroaches moths uh and parasitic worms which are kind of na- nasty looking so let's just take a quick look at this i'm going to go ahead and share my screen here And then, uh, let's have a look. This is Mission Control to J. I can't believe it's been two years since I saw you last. How's Bobby? Miss you both so much. I'm heading out on another secret mission. I want to come see you, but I need to keep fighting. Everything I do is to protect you. Come here. Drive. You can't just get in the car as fast as you can possibly. You want to beat you? Tripping my boys at 3 a.m. No, wait, stop! No. This operation extends to all the Jason states. They have no idea the kind of danger that they're in. Why can't we go home? They say you're road trip for the rest of the mission. Okay. All 
right. Get this paused here. There you go. All right, so uh, yeah, that's it. Um, so a quick look at that. It's a uh, more psychological drama. It's more classic sci-fi fare. Um, so as mentioned, it's uh, very much about um, father-son relationship, but obviously you tell the story of the heightened, the heightened this reality of what they're facing. There's some crazy, uh, you know, CG parasitic creatures, more or less, is what they're dealing with. So, um, so there you go. A quick look at that. Projects, um, since I'm not getting a, a question presented to me currently, hopefully you guys can hear me, but, um, and refer to if, if so. Um, let me just talk about the scope of the projects I'm working on currently. Um, the Amazon project, all the old nice was an additional, uh, Amazon project out of the UK. The scope of my work relative to it was to line up, um, California, um, uh, sessions, right? So, um, ultimately alignment of locations relative to California, which, which the principal production was supposed to take place, but, um, Ultimately, the uh, pr the primary uh, location was stage bound in the UK, and um, and that work was done um, plate wise here um, relative to um, uh, those locations, right? So plates here in California, interior stage works done here, right? So ultimately. Um, that was a pretty easy, straightforward, and successful with a smaller scope of location work. The current project I'm on for Netflix, um, you know, it's a much bigger project. So it's bigger in scope. It's bigger in the um, the amount of work to be done. There's a lot of environment work. You know, it's a post-apocalyptic bird box, right? So if you guys have seen it, um, then yes, let's, uh, you know, you have an idea of what the scope of that work what uh, could be and ultimately it's about a post-apocalyptic world kind of gone mad right where any time you see and look look at this reality outside it evokes terror and horror and you know creatures come and get you so the scope of this work is similar to that it's a lot of uh, various you know creepy scary environment work um, a lot of post-apocalyptic um environment it's relative to a big city barcelona spain we are trying to do a lot of this work um to um clean up and remove a lot of you know people in the streets who are not available there's a lot of crashed cars and burnt out uh, storefronts etc right so part of this is uh, kind of get an idea with the scope of the picture uh, like how big this is supposed to be how much work uh, it will entail and ultimately uh, a matter of you know, what we need to uh, achieve with the budget we have, right? So, you know, part of that is, uh, you know, the simple part of it is the the financial side of it. Okay, we, we expect to cost this much money. We'd like, we'd like to spend this much money. We want, you know, an amazing product as much as possible. But of course, it becomes a matter of, you know, what is the best creative choice to tell your story within the limitations of a, you know, a finite budget. Right. You know, you can't there's not an endless amount of budget budget versus even though you're working on a larger Amazon project, a larger Netflix project, HBO, et cetera. There's always budget limitations. Right. So um, part of that is, you know, kind of, you know, I think at this point for me, a lot of it is really actually turning away additional effects work. You know, I, I feel that it's not within the scope of things that are going to tell a story effectively if uh, production design can you know bring what they uh bear to uh the story in terms of a set build or a piece or uh, production design or set decoration versus what i can do in post you know it's it's you know it's it is unlimited you know the the question constantly comes to you from producers can you do this can you do that and the answer is always yes with time money and talent you know so there's the variables that are finite you know, do you have the time to, to do it right? Do you have the creative talent, which I'm assuming many of you guys are coming from? And do you have the money, right? So you know, within finite resources, the, you know, it's like, okay, well, cool. But, you know, the realistic portion is that 
whatever the story you're trying to tell, there's always a creative angle. So you're like, I oh, know yeah, it really sucks. We can't really do this, but you've seen stuff done on a very tight budget and really focusing on exactly the story they want to tell. And, you know, with amazingly positive and really awesomely creative results. Right. So it really becomes a matter of like, what's the most focused, you know, representation of visual effects you could have within a, a finite budget, right? You know, there's always, there's always a limitation of how much you can do, how much time you can spend on doing it to kind of get it out and released and present to the world around us and uh, how much money uh, is available to that. So in this project currently here that I'm going into, you know, it becomes a matter of really like, yeah, I think it might be best to do it practically as a practical effect, for example, a practical fire effect, a, uh, a, uh, or a stunt gag that is done practically as a, a character on a wire being pulled versus a, a digital double, for example, you know? So there becomes this, uh, so part of it is financial, obviously, but part of it is really just execution as well. It's like, what's going to look the best? And then do we have the, the time, money, talent to do that? You know? So it might not be that it is all visual effects. I might push and say, hey, let's try to get in camera. Let's really, you know, I'll, I'll uh, support that effort in terms of like, maybe it's a stunt where a character falls off of a, of a platform or a building in a fight scene, which we do have that kind of scope of work. Obviously there's gonna be stunts, uh, there's gonna be wire removals and stunt, potential stunt pads on, on, these, on these particular uh, moments here, you know, can we do it digitally? Of course, of course we can. We can do, and we're gonna do shots that are that. You know, it's like, you know, yes, full on digital double, that's the path we're, we're gonna do it. It's gonna suit that shot the best. And then, okay, on this one here, let's look at a practical solution of a stunt drop and with wire su supporting the character and talent and stunt performers. You know, there might be a pad removal, et cetera. You know, that's gonna play really well. It's gonna be effective and in camera and gritty and good, you know. Um, Yes, we're going to do some cleanup and fix it work to it, but that's, you know, probably going to be a really good result, reasonably budget and probably, you know, and effective in terms of effective storytelling, you know, versus doing everything digital. It doesn't have to be that way. And again, so that stunt is a good example. Um, production design is a good example. Obviously for us, it's just a matter of, you know, we do have a world where it's supposed to be a lot less people, you know, very few running cars, kind of very much in the yoke of 28 days later, you know, uh, we're trying to shut down the city ultimately. And part of that is production. And then ultimately at some point, part of it becomes the responsibility of us to, you know, remove, lock down, replace, build set extensions and or digital map paintings of a lot of different environments. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, there's costs associated with that and it becomes a matter of like, okay, you've got eight shots based on the current bid. And certainly one of the things that I haven't mentioned yet is like, you know, to this point, you go into pre-production as much as possible, getting that information to, to everyone involved, right? You have those conversations and they are quite lengthy of pre-production of, you know, this is what we can do. This is what permits are allowed for us to do. You know, this is the cost associated with this. If we go another route of just shooting as is and letting this stuff go, how much is it gonna cost for us to remove it, clean it up, fix it in post? You know, uh, it, it fixing it in post is usually like my last option, but realistically it becomes, you know, the, the non-glamorous part of it is running numbers, talking with your team, figuring out the cost associated with it versus the cost associated with shutting down a whole city. You know, it's obviously there are costs associated with that a popular cafe, a restaurant, a, a tourist attraction in background, a background of plates, you know, um, can you shut down an entire city? No. So it becomes time schedule execution for what you want to do, the best time to do it, the most cost effective way to do it. And again, really also communicating that, you know, the responsibility of the effects supervisor and or producers on the effects of the effects team is to communicate this kind of big picture goal of whatever the creative endeavor is to the rest of your team, get their feedback, you know, like it's, it's a community, it's a team, it's, you know, filmmaking is the most co collaborative effort, right? So we have to have that communication back and forth with, uh, with a team of like, what, you know, what do you feel you can do is, you know, with the time with, you know, if we have a week to do this, is that going to be enough? You know, do you want two weeks? I mean, obviously those, 
those discussions with your, with your artist based on their experience level, based on what they understand about what they can do and have done in the past is a big part of this conversation, right? So ultimately you want to have those conversations. You're not, you don't like, you know, you know, write checks of like time. It's like, oh yeah, we totally got this and I'm going to, I'm going to bill and bid it at two days. And it's like, you know, it's, it's removing, you know, an entire city versus a people, you know, um, do we think it's possible? Yes. Do, is it enough time to do it? Maybe not, you know, so you really want to have those conversations with your team, get their feedback, have that affect the logistics of your bid, how, how, co- how, what the cost, real world costs associated with it will be, and then plan accordingly. You know, the good news is if you do all this in pre-production and really get your head around what you need to tell from a storytelling standpoint, what you need to tell and needs to be visual effects versus what needs to be the responsibility of the other department and share that responsibility and to kind of figure out the best, the best combination to tell that story, you know, the best utilization of, uh, department skills, uh, and, uh, and proceed that way, you know? So, so I, there, I, you know, the, the not so glamorous part, but the logistical communication part up front is really, uh, vital, you know, talk with the departments, get their feedback, you know, get the production design, practical effects, cinematography, right. Um, and even the producing company, you know, company, in my case, it becomes like, can we shut this down? You know, can we shut down a city? Can we get access to this? You know, what's the best time and date to do this, to shoot plates, you know? So from my angle for, you know, to cover, cover the butts of visual effects, you know, I want to figure out like, okay, if we can get a clean plate on an alternate day, or at least some good reference on a day that we're not shooting principal photography, I take a B unit out or run out with my own, you know, crew, you know, can we get that information to make our jobs quicker, better, faster? You know, um, so you kind of like cal- run all those calculations in your head. You know, you figure out what's the best pan- plan of attack and and move move through it accordingly, right? So, uh, so there's a lot of those things involved, right? So, and I've come to this from being an artist through the years, um, through being uh, uh, all the way up to being you know sh- lighting and shooting and and principal production. So I've done my side of production, like in, in you know on set lighting shooting, you know all that directing, producing, line producing. I've kind of, you know, played with it all a little bit here. Uh, But you kind of run all those calculations and what's the best game plan and how this can work out, right? So, uh, you know, and ultimately, like a lot of you are looking to become artists and or run your own companies and be be vendors. So, um, you know, it's it's tough. You know, you really want to, and the more you know about the project, the better, you know, the, the expectations of what, you know, and sometimes you just have those conversations. Like sometimes the expectations are maybe, beyond what the scope of the money uh, available to it is. Now, the good news is it's not the end of the conversation. There's always, you know, to, to our advantage, it's it's creative storytelling. So you could tell the same or similar story in a slightly different way and still convey a similar feel. I mean, there's certainly times where you really want a big budget effect. You know, the last project I just showed you is not, you know, there are very specific visual effects, but it's not like a big Marvel visual effects extravaganza. It's really a, a father son drama action movie, sci-fi, you know, versus other projects, which are very much more effects heavy and, and uh, uh, intensive. And obviously the budgets re- will reflect that, but you know, you can really do a lot with little, if you really just huddle together as an entire team, figure out exactly what you really want to convey and what's most important to tell that story and then they'll plan accordingly. Right. So it's all doable. You know, the cool thing is we have creativity at our disposal, at our disposal to, uh, to really focus on telling the correct and most appropriate story and the best utilization for, uh, for our skills as artists and all, all storytelling. Okay. So let's see, uh, was there a question? I think, yeah. Okay. So here, um, all right. So a few questions here in the lobby. So I'll try to make sure I don't ignore these and hit these here. Um, Inspiration, be, oh, what's my inspiration behind becoming a, a successful visual effects supervisor? So what's my inspiration? So a little bit about me. Um, I come to this world of visual effects, probably of Gen 1 Star Wars, right? So, you know, old school, been doing it a while, but obviously 
like many of us, you know, being inspired by films, you know, so obviously that's a certain starting point. I started in my lineage, my family is kind of the creative artist type, you know, so I started as a traditional uh, in art school. So old school, classic painting, sculpting, traditional media and visual arts, you know, but more and more, I found myself dabbling in technology, dabbling in, uh, you know, uh, media and filmmaking in early videos in the late nineties, you know, um, way back in the day, um, and being and Marvel and of, you know, and coming from California, you know, the, you know, uh, Hollywood 101 here, uh, kind of just being inspired by that and more and more just, you know, dabbling with filmmaking as a, as a kid, you know, as a super eight kid, bring you know, that, Super 8 movie is a lot of my childhood right there, you know, running around shooting films, you know, sending it off to labs. Now it's so easy to tell an amazing story. I mean, so much more easy than it becomes like, okay, cost is not as much associated with it. You know, technology is a lot more accessible to the masses of anyone here. And then it becomes really, what's the story you want to tell? You know, what's the most interesting thing you, what do you have, what do you have to say? You know, and, and what's, what's interesting about what you want to, the story you want to tell. So so I come to it artistically, and I think the cool thing about this in terms of visual effects and what it has to offer for me personally and in general for the world is like, it's an interesting amalgamation of artistry, technical, and even business. So obviously technologies associated with it, bleeding edge technologies of virtual production we're jumping into now. You know, there's never a dull moment. There's never like, okay, I understand this. I've learned how to do this. Great. I'm done. You know, in the early days of Hollywood, maybe a little bit, but still, I mean, there's progressions in the, our history of it's a black and white film. It's color films. It's silent. Now it's sound, you know, it's kind of, it's, uh, you know, technology and artistry always evolves. And no matter what you're doing, it's, it's always slightly different, right? There's always a new, uh, a new paintbrush to pick up a new way to kind of think about it, you know? So, um, so yes, um, very much so an amalgamation of uh, science, technology, business, but also to this point, it's not, it's not an individualized art. It's not like me as auteur, me as like, this is my art piece and this is my gallery show, you know, which is great, more power to that artistry, but it is much more about us. It's about a collaborative process. You know, it's like, hey, I know somebody who's an amazing you know, modeler. I know somebody who's, uh, you know, just really passionate about character rigs. I know somebody who's really savvy with CG lighting, you know, and like, it, and, or it might be you as a generalist, you know, you dabble a lot in all this stuff here and you feel pretty good about it. You know, it's, it's all of that, you know, but even so it's just like, you know, are you working with, with actors? Are you working with a greater, you know, environment? It certainly, you know, could be a fully animated project and it could be just utilizing, voice talent, music, etc. But it is very much beyond just one sole artist, a, a, a very broad collabor collaboration. So it's a, it's a, it's a group effort. So I think that's what makes it unique. That's what makes it hard and incumbent upon us to communicate well and kind of share ideas and kind of collaborate to the best possible creative result that we can have. But it also can be the most rewarding part of it. And obviously the most, one of the most unique parts about it as well. So there you go. All right. Uh, let's see. Our next question is, um, what are the most different, what is the most difficult shot that I've ever handled? Okay. That's a, that's a pretty good shot. That's a pretty good question. Um, uh, and of course, like, you know, at some, at some point, you know, oh, it's a, Hey, it's another monitor insert. Hey, it's another, you know, it's another phone insert. And then, you know, it's certainly at that point, it's like, okay, I've done this before. It's cool. Great. I, you know, I'm, I, you know, I get to be creative. I get to be fun. I'm being employed to it. But then those stressful moments come up like, oh yeah, by the way, how do I do this? And what this next, you know, so I guess the short answer is, you know, American Horror Story, the fr you know, freak show. So that was quite a, a difficult challenge. So for those who've seen it, the uh, the shot that we really kind of had to dig in on on was the uh, Sarah Paulson's performance of a two headed girl Dot and Bet right so so one it's episodic television and as you may or may not know you know it's a quite fast turnaround right so it's Ryan Murphy it's a bit quick it's a bit challenging right so uh, quick turnarounds of 
and late late deliveries of final script shooting and execution so in essence we would start in probably two to two to three days turn over an entire episode's first pass of visual effects and then within another week final it for that episode okay so really fast turnarounds i mean the project i'm on now as a feature has a year long timeline right so we can really kind of dig into things i mean we're not going to burn time but you know you really have to focus on what's important so a bit stressful to some you know but you know and it was something that really hadn't been assessed ultimately it's it's a girl with two heads and it was shot twice the performance was merged together i'll try to find something here as a visual here in a second but um it was incredibly challenging and again it really but to to our advantage it really boils down to hardcore principles of compositing right so it's like do you know how to track do you are you really good at tracking are you really good at you know color and color manipulation and blending stabilization like all that basic core principles of compositing you're like okay i'm a, i can remove stuff or whatever you know great um you really want that core foundation because that next level of stuff might be like, oh yeah, you need to create a whole new performance, a human actor performance out of two takes. And you're like, okay, this is different, you know, and it becomes stabilization of performance. It becomes, you know, blending and really like getting into deep nuances of, of breath and human performance and like, you know, all that nuance and like, stuff you don't even think about you know and stuff that you really want to dig into more of like okay you know there's two performances one is the dominant performance and the other is the more passive performance so you actually as a visual effects artist are trying to get your head into performance and how that relates to the physicality of a, a human uh, a human being that could be merged together into one person and it you know it's always really challenging i mean really tight timelines blending performances together rebuilding fabric and materials and clothing you know so it became like it's really hardcore you know comp principles and things we we probably all you know are savvy to and have done before but then it becomes like okay this whole performance is moving you know it's splitting two different performances together you know hair overlapping which shoulder like it became a lot of like calculations of difficulty so and again like you know human performance you know we we look at human faces so much it's like you know, we, we really know what works well and what a human face looks like and the physicality of performance and what that should feel like. But then it's just like, okay, now this is new. This is different. I mean, real examples do exist. You know, there is a real two-headed, you know, you know, uh, twin, uh, and there have been in the past, but it's, it's quite difficult. It's quite unique. It's different. It's not every, it's certainly not every day you see this. So, ridiculously challenging very hard and i guess you know to our suffering as an entire team um we were awarded with uh the emmy for you know best visual effects that year so it was good you know it was difficult it was stressful but the good news is the rest of the planet said oh yeah by the way we understand that looks really difficult that looks really sucky that looks like you know how'd you guys do that you know what were the thought process behind there and it, and it did evolve you know we we went on in on a track of understanding it how we could do it one way, you know, like, so one thing we kind of went in with the, you know, a buddy of mine who I've worked with him, uh, subsequently, uh, Justin Ball came up with a, okay, we'll do a prosthetic head, you know, so we'll do a green screen head. You're like, okay, but what does that offer us? And I think, you know, ultimately the cool thing about it was it offered us an ability to really help performance. So like going into it with, you know, allowing our performers to get a sense of the, me the mechanics and physicality of actually supporting another head and being a little bit more aware of that. I mean, uh, that's a huge part of the calculation of this visual effects, you know, and I understand it. And there's certainly more of that um, associated with what we need to do, you know, like really convey the, uh, with the audience what you're trying to do and the physicality of it and how heavy that is as, okay. an, as a supervisor. Right. So there is that um, that ability for sure. So. Um, so that became part of the role too. It's like, and we evolved. Well, eventually we, you know, Sarah got it down. We were able to remove that. She still had that physicality of performance as a very good actor of like, okay, bear in mind, I have another head to support. I'm not doing this and kind of, you know, easing into it or whatever. It's like, I'm always aware of this physicality of left, right performances. And it worked out well. She's, you know, she's fantastic with it. The effects team came up, rose to the challenge and it was a success. There you go. 
All right, and then uh, let's see. There's another one here. Let's see what what is your what is what is your advi? Oh, advice for a new uh, for a new visual effects supervisor. Okay, so what's my advice? Okay, these are good. These are good. These are great. You know, uh, and part of this is learning from experiences, things you do right, things you could do to be doing better. You know, as an effects supervisor, obviously, you know, spend as much time getting the core foundation of the basics of all things compositing and or visual effects, I should say, specifically broader broader scope, right? Um, now, it's not just about cool effects. It's not about the latest technology. Again, I'll go back to that point. It also comes back to communication with the other departments, you know? So, you know, as an effects supervisor in, in storytelling and in filmmaking for episodic TV, for feature films and commercials, even games, it becomes a team effort. So you really, you really want to communicate well. You really want to know what everyone else has to offer. You know, you want to be able to support them as they support you because it is a, it is a group effort. So, uh, you know, know as much as possible. Don't fear having to continually learn because you're going to continually learn. And technology and approaches and techniques are always changing, constantly changing, you know. And some old school technologies will still be there and still be utilized and work quite successfully. So no, again, you can never know enough. Um, constantly be open to learning new things. Try different things we haven't tried before. I mean, new technology is coming out of the gate. Everyone's like, okay, what works? What doesn't? Jump onto it, you know. Um, play with it. Experiment with it. Learn from what doesn't work and try to make things better. So, you know, it's it's a lot. It's a lot. There's a lot of fact, factors involved in it. Um, obviously, the one primary key is your eye. You know, what looks good, what works well, what feels right, and then also conveying that and translating that into, again, because it is a collaboration. It's like, you know, I, I know what I like or I know what feels right or feels quote unquote natural or you'll constantly get these comment commentary of like, oh, hey, um, it has to be photo real. And it's like, okay, well, what do we think the photo real is? And I'll, I'll, you know, I'll look at examples and I'll have conversation. I think part of the, something to your benefit would be to, to get reference points. And I'll, I'll talk about films and I'll talk about things that I like, or as other, other examples that are good examples or other examples that are bad examples and, and kind of, you know, dissect what doesn't work about it, what could be better or what can work and what does work well and how can you incorporate it in your current or future projects as well, right? So, so it's like any artist, you, you look at what, <clears throat> what other people are doing, like what other people are doing well, what other people are doing that might not work quite so well. And then what do you learn from that? What can you take away from that? What can you apply to it in your own projects or in projects you're working on to, see, to serve a, a greater goal of one, visual effects supervisor, right? So there's a lot, there's certainly a lot. And then, and then there's some of those other things too, are, you know, learn, learn experiences of like, you know, put yourself in the other, the head of somebody else's department and kind of like, okay, you know, how, how am I going to support them? How, what, what, what are they looking to do? What, what it would help them in their role? And then hopefully they're doing the same for you. Right. So, so a lot of it is, you know, back and forth in that regard. And then, uh, you know, also, you know, what, uh, what works, what doesn't work, but ultimately it does boil down to the eye. You know, that's the most difficult part about it. You know, you can, I can teach people to put together, you know, uh, different plate stuff and different, you know, foreground green screen and different backgrounds and match them up and get stuff as technically right as possible. But then, you know, you'll have these subjective moments of like, it doesn't feel, and you will also have to kind of translate what, a, a non-artist is trying to say someone who's a storyteller or maybe just a script writer who might be directing or you know or somebody else or an actor and like you know how does this how would i represent this and you know what could tell this story better and what works better for for that uh for that angle and you'll you'll find even acting even working with actors on set though they'll ask you questions about like, how, how is this going to go together? How is it affecting my performance? And like, that goes to what is important to them, what their tool sets are, what we're bringing to the, to the story. So, you know, it's, um, it's a collaboration. So you got to like get calculate in your head, you know, 
by the way, we need to convey this to another department, to an actor, to production design, to uh, the cinematographer. It's like, you know, this is what we have to offer. This is, you know, if we do it this way, it's going to look, it, it might look better. It's going to make it easier on you in this regard. It's going to offer you this creative solution that you might not have thought about. So, so it is a lot of communication. It's knowing what you feel will be the best executed. And, the, and really at some point it becomes, okay, here it is. How do I make it better? And that's how do I make it better is the hardest part. Well, you know, what looks bad about it? What could be better about it? And how do I get to that solution? You know, what's the what's the language, the technical language, the creative language to convey to yourself, your team uh, of artists to get to a better solution? You know, uh, some of it is looking at reality. Like, I'll, you know, many of us will walk around looking at clouds, looking at trees, looking at edges of streets handing off to gravel and like say that doesn't look right or that feels that feel, you know, I'm, I'm taking note of that. And oh, by the way, look, there's reflectance on this wet road here that uh, I wouldn't expect, or like all that little nuance of perception. And that kind of really ties back to being a fine artist and then learning that skill of like looking, perceiving and calculating and processing. And how does that apply to a new reality? There's a lot, there's a lot that you can go about and take notes about in your head about, oh, by the way, this is what this looks like. And I haven't seen that before. And, or what would this do? And sometimes reality looks bizarre. It looks fake. It doesn't look right. But you really got to look at it, analyze it and just say like, you know, what it does, to, what what is happening in reality? What does reality look like, et cetera? So a lot to calculate there. Again, um, know as much as you can communicate well with others and then what makes it look better what is the best solution that's i guess that's that's my uh there's my uh breakdowns from there okay uh, all right so any of the other questions uh, or is that it again like the focus on this is you know ultimately also the business side of it as well but it's really hard to separate it from also uh, it might sound simple of like, okay, it's just a numbers game, but it's not. It's also calculation of um, of technical, uh, creative, and how that applies. You know, like look at your, uh, you know, look at what the scope of your project is. You know, project comes to you. You know, the you have a conversation with creatives, what they what they have to offer, what their expectations are. Storyboards help, but it's a visual medi medium. And sometimes people who are not so uh, visual, but might be just more writers don't get it, uh, don't get it well, or don't perceive it well. So communicate what you think the expectations are. They, they do the same for you. Previs is great. Storyboards are great. Uh, common references of like similar projects that have been done or done well, or be done, or done poorly. Um, have that communication with them, figure out what works well. And that's going to, uh, that's going to influence your budget. That's going to influence the, uh, the execution of it. You know, it's like, how big does this want to have, you know, constantly ask questions of like, you know, don't be a, don't be a nuisance, but like, Hey, if it's important, like, what are the expectations? Like how, how much of this thing do we want to see? You know, how big is our world? You know, how much character animation do we want to see over the sequence? Is it over five shots? Is it one, it's at a magic water, you know? You know, this environment builder, we're going to destroy the whole world. Do we see that every shot or is it just one shot? And we kind of, the coverage from there forward is quite small and much more reasonable and, and dressed by production design versus handled by visual effects. A lot of questions, a lot of kind of, th kind of things to calculate, but that all affects your budget, the scope of your budget, the expectations of how much you need to do and uh, the team you need to assemble or hopefully have relationships with and know is like, hey, there's a perfect person who's good at X, Y, or Z, you know, different skill sets, get the right team together and bring the best project to bear, to market. There you go. There you go. All right. 220 on my side of the world here. I think I have like another 10 minutes. Other questions? Or are we good? Take a little coffee here. Um, but yes, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about um, finance and budget and schedule. The you know what I find the least glamorous part of it. Hey, my my dad was an accountant. It's probably something he would would love. You know, but um, 
but it does. Uh, but one, it is important. This is a business. You know, you don't want to. You don't want to waste money. You don't want to have your endeavors, your company, your uh, your uh, your effects vendors go under, right? So you might want to have the communication of like, you know, what you expect the uh, the expectations are, what corners could be cut that are not going to affect the quality of your final final piece versus what you really feel you need to have. And, and of course, with that, you know, how much labor, how much time is going to be associated with that. So, you know, really have that communication with your artist as a team. Like if I'm a visual effects supervisor and I know like, you know, somebody else who's doing the work all the time is going to have a much better assessment than me. You know, if I go to them and say, you know, we feel that this whole building uh, will not hold up as a map painting, cannot just be done in comp. We're seeing it with a drone shot. We're kind of hovering over for several shots. We're thinking it probably going to be better to better suited as a 3D build. You know, what's associated with that? What, you know, how much time do we feel we need to model it, to, to light it for texturing? You know, uh, is our dynamics in that in that piece? You know, kind of ask all those questions and then go to the people who are, are going to do it. You know, if you, you know, ask their assessment, this is going to be one week to build, you know, um, is there pre-existing assets that we can kind of build and incorporate into this, you know, um, is there kind of elements that I can go and shoot or bring to bear, you know, for one for reference to that actually could be used in the final comp composite and final piece, you know, um, texture references when they're on set and go there, can I shoot it? Can I go, can I get a scanner together? Can I go and do a scan and real, uh, get a LIDAR team and scanner? You know, I have a pocket, I have a, an iPhone pocket solution with small, you know, low end scanner now. Like, is that helpful? At least it's going to talk to us about scale, size, uh, you know, physical relationships. That could be a good starting point. I can get, get that from set. I can get that back to my team. You know, do we want to spend the time and, and money and effort to do a more intricate scan do we see this asset and it becomes a uh, it becomes you know really the calculations of how much are we going to see this asset how many times do we see this building you know is it an intricate part of the storytelling and this kind of ties into this whole idea of virtual production you're like okay well right now that technology is fairly expensive you know does you know what are the variables associated with the production of do i see this environment again again and again I'm in pre-production discussions about a piece that kind of is that is much more of like, it's kind of very much one environment that kind of means it might play pretty well for this virtual production technology. So, you know, versus I have one shot, a couple, a couple shots in the sequence, but one that's really, you know, very logistic, logistically uh, useful in this virtual production to kind of tie into future technologies and budget and time and what works best. It's like we can do the screen screen, yes, um, but you know the, what it has to offer for us aesthetically is reflective surfaces off a of pre predetermined metallic y kind of semi gloss reflective foreground set build. You know, so it's going to inherit all that cool stuff that's very hard to recreate uh, comp wise, finesse wise, of like all that magic that you would have to spend a lot of time, money, effort, pain, blood, and sweat to to get right and real and comp versus like. Hey, you know, we're going to spend the time to build that asset, shoot plate, high res plates, mash up and build an environment build. You know, in this case, it's like, a, as I'm closing out here in a couple of minutes, uh, is that it's um, a variable of like time, you know, like the, it's a, it's a perfect magic hour shot, you know, and, and uh, insulated in the script going, going back to the directors, going back to the screenwriters, it's like two and a half pages of dialogue. So magic hour over two and a half pages of dialogue, you know, achievable in real time, maybe a 30 minute, an hour is probably more a 30 to 40 minute window, but you know, it's a good utilization of this. You know, we're seeing in a, a controlled environment, you know, we're not actually in an, in an exterior environment shooting at sunset, ready, go. And hopefully we get it in a cold winter day currently here in a, uh, you know, in Spain, you know, um, it offers the cinematographer a lot of control. It offers them a, a, a really default look. You know, production design, having conversations back and forth with a production design and, and like logistics of the location, like what do we want to represent? What's a good visual uh, key indicator that says this this environment, the city we're in? Um, you know, um, so all those things kind of come to bear. Like how how much how well it serves the schedule, how well it serves cinematography, how well it controls our day. Uh, repeatability, you know, uh, accessibility of actors and making it a little bit more uh, effective for them on, 
on the day we shoot, you know, uh, versus being in there. Now there's pluses and minus to all this thing, but you know, we kind of run the numbers. We kind of figured out like, okay, we could do this. We can find ex exact place we want to do. We can kind of build a map painting if we need to. We've got assets we're working on right now, currently in pre-production. We shot a test yesterday with a complete 360 camera for other stuff we're going to do for environment stuff, for, for moving car, bus projections, for quote unquote, uh, other extraterrestrials. I won't blow too much NDA stuff. For other uh, extra, uh, I'm sorry, I should more supernatural uh, looks. Let's just say that. Um, so, you know, shooting test and getting all that stuff and kind of figuring out what's the best approach, you know, and we landed on, you know, trying a virtual production, uh, solution, utilizing it, uh, here locally. We have, uh, three different locations that we can kind of tie into and use as well. We know it's going to serve our schedule for, for the production, for, for the first ADs and for the production coordinators, for the, for the schedule of it, the logistics getting it done. The cost is pretty negligible difference between doing it all in green screen traditional post. The upside is uh, talent, uh, more amenable to talent. One for an exterior that's going to be, you know, be really tough. And uh, again, cinematography. Like I, I kind of go to that visual exactly straight away out of the gate. It's like, yes, I've been on the shoots and I've chased sun around and you know until the very last minutes of what's usable in camera. And we would probably not make our day. We'd probably make it be shot over several days to kind of get the same thing. So it's much more effective in terms of time schedule, time equals money. So you kind of run those calculations and it, it is, it's like, you can't really tear the creative out of it. You can kind of figure out <coughs> technical and time, but creative is also part of that, that equation. So, which makes it a little more interesting for us the creatives, but, um, that is um, a, a, some examples of kind of real world stuff that we're dealing with in terms of effect of the budget, uh, how that affects schedule, uh, scheduling and the finances associated with it. Uh, you know, again, I'm going to go back to, I guess, in closing here, the one thing that really does help for, for us is, uh, is that there's always a creative solution. Right. So, you know, if yourself, you're directing a piece or if you are from, from a writer's perspective of what's the story needs to be conveyed to the audience, you know, you pick and choose obviously within a limited a world of limited options. Right. You have you don't have unlimited resources. You really want to be effective in your storytelling. You really want to show the, the most effective right solution, whether it's visually or narratively um, and, you know, and be accurate, be focused and and uh, tell the best story you can. There you go. All right, I think I have like three minutes left. So um, if there's, unless there's any other questions, I'll duck out of here in about three. Oh, there you go. Yeah, thank you so much, Martin, for joining us. Uh, it was a great and insightful session. Uh, great. I'm glad you have answered all the Q&A questions. So I, uh, yeah. Okay, very yeah. good. Thank you so much. Sorry about the delay and lag there, but uh, yes, I think we got through it. All right. Thank you so much. Hopefully you guys uh, go out there and create your own masterpieces and become uh, effects supervisors and run up the ranks of artistry and tell compelling stories. There's a lot of uh, options out there and a lot of stories. Thank you so much, and I'll see you on other sessions. Thank you so much. Bye.